so we previously assessed diet. Uh, I mean, diet is a very heterogeneous thing. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm actually presenting on this in a, in a separate context. Uh, and just the, the, the range of what they've done with diet ranges from uh, uh, querying individual foods and, and, you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that, or for instance, processed and unprocessed red meat and fish intake uh, and evaluating those associations all the way up to like what we did in this study, assessing diet quality using some standardized instrument. Uh, and then there's also ways of really comprehensively assessing what people are eating over the course of, uh, you know, 12 months or the preceding couple of weeks, and then applying things like factor and index analysis to really reduce that to broad patterns of diet. However, what we did here is kind of the middle ground, which is uh, applying a diet quality instrument, in this case, the diet habits questionnaire, uh, which is a 24 inch, uh, in question instrument, which uh, gives you an overall uh, score of diet quality range from zero to hundred uh, percent. We previously assessed this in our Holosum. So this is our using our Holosum cohort. So the health outcomes and lifestyle and a sample of people with MS, which is a large international cohort of people that have now been followed to 7.5 years of follow-up is an international sample. The large portion of our participants are coming from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, and the United Kingdom. However, they come, the baseline sample comes from 66 different countries. Uh, but anyway, uh, what this is now a sample of people that has followed us to 7.5 years. Now, previously, when we assessed the diet habits questionnaires association with different elements of uh, progression, so disability, relapse, fatigue, depression, and quality of life, we've generally found beneficial association, particularly at baseline. So the baseline reviewed diet quality was associated with better all those outcomes. However, there's a significant potential when you do a cross-sectional study like that for reverse causality. So it's not so much that diet or another factor of interest is protective of the outcome. It just so happens that the distribution of, of that behavior happens to be more common among people that have less active disease. So particularly, that's a particular issue when you look at things like physical activity or even sun exposure that require ambulation so that people that are less disabled or less fatigued or have less relapses are more apt to engage in that behavior. And so you see potentially a protective quote unquote association. In the case of diet, uh, there's less risk for that, but still a potential. And so it's important to do a perspective study. And we've assessed prospectively the relationship of diet at baseline with subsequent disability at the 2.5 year time point, and also the quality of life at the 2.5 and 7.5 year time points. And what we've done here is we've looked, as I said, up to the 7.5 year time point, looking at baseline diet quality with uh, disability at the 7.5 year time point, so seven and a half years later. And we find a uh, really great consistency uh, between what we found cross-sectionally and prospectively at the 2.5 year time point before such that baseline diet quality is significantly associated with less disability and less disability progression seven and a half years later. However, in addition to just assessing that, because the first question somebody hearing that might be is, well, that's all well and good, but what about the 7.5 years in between? How do you know if people changed? La, la, la. We then assess their trajectories. So how did people's diet quality change between them? Did it go up? Did it go down? Was it stable? And so on. And what we find generally is uh, in line with those results, that people that increased their diet quality or at least kept it stable had less disability progression, while people that decreased their diet diet quality had uh, a greater tendency to increasing disability progression. Uh, in line with our previous results of the 2.5 year time point, we did not see associations with fatigue or depression, which may suggest that the previous cross-sectional findings with those outcomes may indeed have been reverse causality. Uh, however, the findings that we find with, with, uh, with disability uh, is very consistent over time. And the fact that it is robust, both prospectively and through, we, we adjusted for Rel, you know, rel, rel, relevant covariates like age, sex, MS type, uh, 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 fatigue, uh, and uh, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry that this may indicate that these results are actually robust. Uh, however, it is important to assess and replicate this in other samples. There's actually, as I was saying, there's a lot of stuff that's been done with regard to uh, diet in MS, but the majority of it, unfortunately, is cross-sectional or case control in the design, which means it's only done at one time point. Cross-sectional, I mean, 
Marines. They just recruit a lot of people with MS uh, and then say, you know, what are the characteristics of people with and without the different exposures? Case control study, you get a bunch of people with MS, a bunch of people without MS, maybe a match on age and sex and such like, but you are still comparing at one time point. So there's not enough studies that are perspective and certainly over the time point, the time uh, durations that we've done here. So it's important for replication in other settings to be done so that, uh, well, you really need that then to potentially substantiate uh, uh, undertaking an RCT of diet modification. There's a lot I know of encouragement that you may have seen in literature, some RCTs of uh, particular diet programs uh, and assessing their potential effects on MS progression. However, I argue that it's actually quite important to first do the kind of perspective observational studies like we've done here to one assess is diet associated because here again we've shown diet is associated with disability not with fatigue or depression now that could be particular to our sample or it could mean that diet while beneficial with disability is not beneficial with these so it's pointless to then do an rct assessing these outcomes if you're not actually going to potentially see an association so uh, and maybe throw more of your resources at disability but again it's important that people replicate this first before they go doing rcts and certainly people with ms uh, uh in turn that may be your next question, what are people, should they do about diet? Um, uh, uh, much like the vitamin D supplementation that we talked about before, and the evidence is such that there's really not enough evidence that uh, diet modification will modulate your ear disease. Again, largely because of the time that that report was done, the, the MS Re uh, Research Australia guidelines, the, the kind of longitudinal studies that I've just described that we've done hadn't been published yet. Uh, so there was all cross-sectional and case control study, and we were then cautious to make any recommendations. So like vitamin D, it's do what is recommended for your general health as recommended by your GP for your health but don't do it in the hopes of modulating your MS. The evidence is not there yet.